Hello everyone, it's Tuesday and you're watching Within the Frame. I'm Kim bo -kyung. New COVID-19 variants such as Omicron subvariant Eris, known as EG.5, and another, Perola or BA.2.86, have been sweeping across parts of the Euro Europe and the U.S. Uh, South Korea, too, detected its first case of Perola in early September. And to prepare for the upcoming winter season, the Food and Drug Safety Ministry granted special approval for Pfizer's latest vaccine that reportedly works against Perola as well. Uh, the first batch of more than 4 million doses arrived on Monday, and Moderna's vaccine is also going through the approval process as well. What exactly are the latest COVID variants, and how should we deal with them? For more on this, we have invited Dr. Alice Tan, an internist at Miss Medi Women's Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Tan. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being with us. And we also have Professor Peter Chin Hong from the University of California, San Francisco. Good to see you, Professor. Same here, Bo Kiang. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for being with us. Now, uh, Professor Chin Ho, uh, first question to you. So, COVID-19 variants, uh, EG.5 and BA.2.86, unofficially known as Perola and Eris, are being monitored by health authorities around the world. Uh, before we hear about how widely these latest COVID-19 strains are circulating, what exactly are they? Well, uh, EG5.1, also known as uh, Eris, uh, is a flavor of XBB and Omicron. And, um, you know, I think it has a few more mutations, uh, you know, particularly what people call flip mutations that make them more transmissible and hold on a little bit more to the receptors of the doors that allow them to enter the body. Um, you know, I think that they're very dominant right now. They're, you know, selected because they're more transmissible, but the vaccines work against them. The new vaccines work against them. Um, the other one, uh, Perola or X, uh, BA uh, 2.86, that's scary to a lot of people because it has many more mutations. So when you look at this year, to go from one XBB to the next, one variant to the next, maybe you are different by about two mutations. To go to this new one, uh, BA 2.86, which is not very common yet, it's about 30 mutations or more. But, you know, there, there's information from about uh, five labs around the world now showing that our current uh, existing immunity from vaccines and from natural infection can overcome uh, Perilla or BA 2.86. Mm, all right, I see. Now, we are going to tap on vaccines, but before that, our professor told us how the, uh, they are uh, dominant already right now. And so, Dr. Ten, how widely are these Omicron subvariants being detected around the world? You know, that's a really good question. And unfortunately, many countries around the world have dismantled their surveillance infrastructure. So the data streams that are available are not as reliable. And the WHO has noted this as well. Uh, for example, over the last 28-day uh, period for which we have data, uh, 1.5 million new cases of COVID were reported. However, there were only 12,445 sequences reported. So it's hard to know whether the data that we're receiving is actually representative of what's actually circulating. But EG.5 does seem to be the dominant strain in most countries that are reporting cases. Uh, in South Korea, it's making up 34% of the sequences. At the WHO, it's reported to make up 26% of sequences, sequences uploaded in, onto GSED. And the United, in the United States, it's making up 22% of cases. In terms of the number two uh, most commonly sequenced subvariant in South Korea, it's the XBB.1.9.1 subvariant. It makes up 21% of all sequences. At the WHO, they're reporting XBB.1.16 as the number two uh, subvariant, coming in at 23%. And in the US, it's a different subvariant altogether. The FL.1.5.1 subvariant is making up 4.5%. Um, this is all to say that what is circulating is all Omicron. They're all flavors of Omicron. Uh, and in terms of the uh, BA.2.86, 
it's uh, been already two months since it was first detected, but um, it doesn't seem to have the kind of growth advantage that um, would make it uh, prominent around the world. Only about a dozen countries have reported this subvariant so far. Mm, right, I see. So though the data cannot be totally reliable, uh, we can definitely see the dominance of the Omicron subvariant. Uh, Professor Chin Hong, so to prevent such variants, Pfizer and Moderna updated their vaccines, uh, which originally target the XBB.1.5 subvariant of the virus. But uh, are these updated vaccines also effective in preventing the variants that we have just talked about? Yes, yeah, so the updated vaccines are effective in preventing uh, these new scary looking <clears throat> variants, uh, even though it's not exactly the variant that's circulating. And that is because uh, when you look at the XBB flavors of Omicron, which has been dominant this year around the world, again, um, they only are different from each other by about one or two mutations. So even though the vaccine is based on another XBB flavor of Omicron, uh, the currently circulating XBB, EG 5.1, or, um, or Eris, uh, is easily uh, conquered by the vaccine. The antibodies you develop can neutralize this variant. When we talk about Perola, or that one with a lot more mutations that I talked about, um, it looks really scary. Uh, but like some people mentioned, it's like a paper tiger because it looks really scary, but then its foundation isn't really good because our foundation is good with the immune immunity that we've built up. And when these labs around the world, uh, in New York, uh, Switzerland, um, uh, China and Japan looked at people's existing antibodies against uh, Perola, it seemed that uh, we were able to fight it off even though it looked scary in the lab. And that's because We've come a long way from 2020, and we've built up a lot of immunity around the world in our populations, so that even though biologically uh, some of these variants look scary, uh, it really is falling on hostile soil. And that's why these vaccines will work um, because of this reason. Mm, right, I see. It's interesting to hear how so we could consider the Pirola as a paper tiger. Now, uh, Professor Chen, one more question. Uh, staying on this new updated vaccine front, uh, just around a week ago, the U.S. CDC recommended the newly formulated COVID-19 vaccines for all Americans aged six months and up. And Reuters said the CDC's decision is much more extensive than that of the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. Uh, how are the vaccine news guidelines different and why is this so? Yes, yeah, so um, I think it is really interesting to see how different countries look at the same science and have different recommendations. I think that no one disputes that the most important population is those over 65. And in the case of the ECDC in Europe, uh, they said over 60. And that's because age is the most powerful risk factor for doing poorly with COVID, even these days. Um, and of course, we also extend that to immune compromised individuals of all age. And in the case of the UK, healthcare workers and those in nursing homes. I think in the US, uh, it was extended to uh, those above six months as well for, for several reasons. The first is that when in a recent US uh, survey, looking at uh, where chronic symptoms from COVID or long COVID exist, the biggest age group was the age group of 35 to 49. So they wanted to give the option to people to get that vaccine because there's some observational studies showing that getting the vaccine can decrease the risk of long COVID or chronic symptoms. For the <clears throat> pediatric population, the pediatricians really wanted the vaccine approved for that population because it's still one of the top 10 killers uh, in the pediatric population. So even though a lower risk of dying compared to older adults, uh, that uh, was extended to that population as well. But frankly, if I was stuck in a desert island and I had limited resources, I would definitely prioritize those over 65 and immune compromised. Mm, I see your point. 
Uh, now, up until now, we have been talking about situation overseas, but uh, Dr. Ten, I'd like to ask you about the current status quo in South Korea. So, uh, health authorities reported the first confirmed case of a Korean patient uh, infected with perilla more than a week ago. And given that the confirmed patient did not have a any record of international travel. What are the chances of the Perilla variant being prevalent in South Korea right now? Right, so the case in question um, was a 45-year-old male who, uh, as you mentioned, did not have any international travel history. According to the KDCA, his symptoms were mild and there have been no reported cases of secondary transmission among his family members or people at work. Um, in terms of transmissibility and severity, however, I think we need to pay attention to a case um, outbreak that occurred in the UK that was uh, published by the UK Public Health, uh, Public, uh, Health Safety Agency, uh, in which case at a care home, there was an outbreak of 28 people due to this Pirola or the BA.2.86 subvariant. Uh, and so we can see that in a close um, contact setting, this subvariant can spread widely and quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something that we need to pay attention to. In addition, in the UK, of the 34 total cases of this subvariant so far, five have required hospitalization. So, of course, the numbers are too few to generalize, but given the numbers that we have so far, that's 15 percent of the cases have required admission to a hospital due to severe disease. So I think if COVID has taught us anything, it's that we should not ignore its behavior that it's showing us from the beginning. In other words, in medicine, we talk about anecdotes, anecdotal cases, anecdotal evidence, and we like to wait until we have more hard evidence. Sometimes with COVID, however, the virus is faster than the science. Uh, and so when it shows us what it can do, what BA.2.86 can do in the UK in terms of spreading among people in a care home setting, that's something that we need to pay attention to in South Korea. Because if it could happen in the UK, it could happen in nursing homes and uh, rehabilitation hospitals in South Korea. It's something that we need to pay attention to and be careful about. Mm, what I see, I mean, given the case that you just mentioned in the UK, I believe uh, we would have to be careful with uh, uh, this uh, subvariant. Uh, and Dr. Ten, that being said, we need to note that this first confirmed case of Perola came after the Korean health authorities downgraded the COVID-19 pandemic level from level two to its lowest level of four, uh, similar to the flu. But uh, how is COVID-19 currently being managed and are such measures uh, enough to prevent recent variants from spreading? Well, so far since the downgrade, uh, we have fortunately seen a decrease in the uh, number of cases so far. Unfortunately, um, as is often the case, um, after the peak in a, in a particular surge, um, two to three weeks after the peak is when we see a peak in ICU cases and deaths, and that seems to be the case for this surge as well, with um, a high number of deaths reported per week. It's the highest in several weeks in, in South Korea due to this um, surge. In terms of our priority going forward, of course, the focus needs to be on protecting people who are most vulnerable, and that would be people over the age of 60 people with immunocompromised chronic conditions, uh, people in these residential uh, settings, vulnerable settings such as nursing homes, prisons, um, uh, convalescent hospitals, rehab hospitals. And also, I think we need to pay attention to what's happening in children less than four years of age in South Korea. Um, in terms of incidence rate and also in terms of uh, uh, children needing ICU care, uh, this is actually something that we've not been uh, paying attention to as much. And I think we need to protect our smallest of, of our population against COVID. We need to do a better job. Um, going forward, in terms of surveillance, 
we've shifted from broad surveillance to sentinel surveillance, but we've expanded our sentinel surveillance sites from 200 sites nationwide to 527. And South Korea still offers PCR testing at our community health centers. So for right now, it does seem like what we're doing is holding up. Um, in terms of if there is another surge, we will need to build up surge capacity again. Mm. But we do seem to be um, mobile and nimble enough to make those adjustments if needed. All right, I see your point. Now, uh, Professor Chin Ho, as part of efforts to prevent new variants, the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety granted emergency approval for Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine last week, and the first batch arrived on Monday and in, at Incheon. Um, health authorities are reportedly considering giving another grant for Moderna's as well. And that being said, first of all, when is such emergency approval given, and could the upcoming winter season be one of the reasons why health authorities are recommending Mending vaccine shots. Yes, um, not only the upcoming winter, uh, Young, but right now, uh, most of the world is seeing uh, increasing cases uh, at actually levels when you look at wastewater that's similar to the highest levels in the history of the pandemic. It's just that many of these cases are not converting to hospitalizations as in the past, but we're still seeing an increase in hospitalizations in the U.S for seven consecutive weeks. Um, so there is an urgency for now, and that's particularly for those who are older than 65 and immune compromised who haven't been infected or who haven't gotten a vaccine for six months or more, which is most of the people. But for those who are younger uh, in the US anyway, uh, and other populations, uh, they can probably wait a little bit longer but you're right, uh, we are expecting to see even more cases during the winter uh, because, again, even though this is the fourth consecutive summer of COVID uh, increasing cases, the winter has traditionally been uh, when uh, COVID comes to much higher levels. And in terms of hospitalizations, it's going to compete with other respiratory viruses like influenza that can really strain ICU and hospital capacity. Mm, right. Now, Dr. Tan, since uh, the winter is coming soon, uh, soon the Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency is to release details of its COVID-19 vaccination plan uh, probably next week. Uh, what should health authorities keep in mind in your opinion? So right now, South Korea has plans to procure 15 million doses combined of Pfizer and Moderna's updated um, XBB variant booster. Um, if we do the math, however, there are actually 15.7 million people in South Korea who would actually need uh, the vaccine. So, um, uh, you know, we had a, a sort of modest uptake rate, I think, of the bivalent booster, maybe 34 percent of people age 60 and over receive that bivalent booster. I think we need to work harder to try to get uh, a higher uptake rate of the um, updated booster when it becomes available. Um, also, I think the uh, government should consider perhaps uh, procuring some doses of Novavax as well. It's not in the plans yet, but um, there are some people who cannot take an mRNA uh, platform vaccine. Um, due to, say, a previous history of myocarditis with an mRNA vaccine or other allergy. And having a protein-based option for a vaccine, I think, could expand the pool of people who can get a booster um, who need it. And so I think those are the things to keep in mind, maybe expanding um, uh, the number of vaccines available, uh, the choices available, but also doing a better job in terms of making a very compelling and successful vaccination campaign. Mm, all right, I see. So we need to get more updated vaccines and perhaps Novavax as well. Now, Dr. Tan, one more question. Uh, to better prevent uh, potential COVID-19 variants, uh, experts have been recently raising their voices, saying the government should take proactive measures such as approving additional COVID-19 treatments in order to minimize the damage. Uh, what's your view on this? Um, I don't know that we necessarily need to um, get more approval of treatments because 
we uh, are currently using Paxlovid. The problem with Paxlovid is the prescription rate is hovering at around 45%. In other words, there are many people who could benefit from Paxlovid who are not being prescribed the medication. And so I think we need to do a better job at facilitating the, the prescription process. In other words, helping doctors make alternatives in terms of their prescriptions of other medications to avoid drug-drug interactions, letting people know that Paxlovid uh, may be indicated for them if they get uh, COVID-19 and they are a high-risk patient. Uh, and so doing a better job with what we've got, I think, is uh, a first line of, of um, in terms of what we can do, uh, activity. The second thing is in terms of the medications that are used in the hospital uh, to treat patients right now, um, dexamethasone, remdesivir, and then the anti-inflammatory medications. Uh, we have all of the medications in Korea that are currently indicated. The one medication that um, is available in Japan, I think Shionoga is the Japanese pharmaceutical company that made a new COVID-19 medication called uh, Excova. Uh, or Zocova, I think it's called. Uh, it's not really a life-saving medication, but it does decrease symptoms by about a day. Uh, that is a medication perhaps that we could consider importing to treat COVID-19. It's an antiviral medication. Um, and in, in addition to helping patients with symptoms, low-risk patients with symptoms, um, it could also potentially decrease their infectivity. So that might increase the, the speed of spread if we have another surge. All right, I see your point. Now, uh, we are running out of time, but I'd like to ask this last question to our Professor Chin Hong. So, uh, according to the Financial Times, the WHO chief urged Beijing to offer more information on the origins of COVID-19 and said that it is ready to send a second team to probe the matter. Uh, up until now, how has the investigation into the genesis of the pandemic been going? And according to the chief, uh, he said that the, if the origin of the pandemic becomes known, that we'll be able to prevent the next one. Is this true? Yeah, so a lot of questions there, Bo Kiang. Uh, I would say that the WHO first gained access in early 2021, uh, but it was criticized for lack of full transparency from the Chinese. Um, but, you know, there are three reasons why people uh, think we should probably want to know the truth. The first is that whether, you know, it may prevent the next pandemic. Personally speaking, I'm not sure. There have been so many other viruses that uh, have jumped over uh, animal species uh, that I'm not really sure knowing this may prevent the next pandemic. The second is really uh, uh, some sense of closure or comfort to those who have been uh, ill or who've lost relatives. Seven million people, after all, have died of COVID around the world. and knowing how it got here might help some of these people deal with the losses. And the third is that uh, if we know that it resulted from a laboratory leak, um, you know, we may be able to bolster uh, securities and more surveillance of, of, of these kinds of labs that house, uh, you know, potentially hazardous pathogens. Um, at the end of the day, the world is still divided as to how the virus uh, came around to arise, uh, but most scientists do believe that it crossed over from animals still because it's so different from the species that we know of anyway that was housed at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Mm, all right, I see. Though we cannot be sure, I hope uh, we could prevent the next pandemic from coming on. Now, uh, unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today's edition. Uh, thank you, Professor Chin Hong and Dr. Tan for your time and insights. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, that's all for Within the Frame tonight. We'll be back tomorrow with more in-depth stories. Thank you for watching and goodbye.